one of the great lessons from the Isra and Miraj is the wafa for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the greatest lesson from Isra and Miraj. If you want to take home a lesson tonight, it's a lesson of wafa, faithfulness to our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because it's easy to be faithful when everything is according to how you like it. It's difficult when things are against you, against you. It doesn't make sense to you sometimes. But you're not patient enough to sit and make sense out of it or listen to it. Or say, and this is why the religion for some people is very difficult. Because they don't have the patience. No, no, it has to be my way. Not God's way, but my way. But the Prophet ﷺ, if you look at his life, is constant qabd and bust. In spirituality of these two stations of constriction and expansion. All of creation is like that. So you have the day is expansion. You have the night is constriction. If you ever been to Umrah or Hajj, you will go to Mecca, it's constriction. You It's the Haiba of the Kaaba. You're really not comfortable. You're not supposed to be comfortable in Mecca. You're supposed to be on your tippy toes. It's the Haram, it's the house of God. You do your worship, you want to get out of there, you're done. Then you go to Medina. It's relax. It's just expansion. You want to stay there for the rest of your life. That's how life is. The heart is constantly pumping. Expansion, constriction. Everything in your life is like that. In your spiritual life, in your physical life, in your mental life. That's why like a lot of the students, they say, oh, I have a, you know, I can't think. Writer's block. It's, it's constriction. You can't write anything. The greatest writer, they can't write something sometime for months. But if you look at his life, getting to the uh, year of uh, the ninth year, which is the year of, this is the year of sorrow, the huzn. It was really the worst year in the Prophet Sallallahu life. He loses Abu Talib, who is his uncle, and who is a supporter for him, and a shield between him and the Quraysh. He loses his beloved wife that he's been married for 25 years, a quarter of a century, Bi Khadija, who was a supporter spiritually, mentally, physically, in every way she was there for him. He also then goes to get support from Taif. He is kicked out, he's stoned. And he said, Taif was the worst day of my life. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, that was the worst day of my life. But that's the, that's constriction. That's the year. And then comes the expansion. That Allah rewards him. For innama al usri yusra. Innama al usri yusra. The Quran reminds us, with every hardship, there's ease. With every hardship, there's ease. You just have to be patient and see the wisdom in the hardship. Allah rewards him with this beautiful night, Al-Isra Miraj. Well, he said, this was the best night of my life. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes to the house of Um Hani. Um Hani is the daughter uh, of Abu Talib. She became Muslim after the death of Abu Talib. The, Abu Talib dies the year before. And this is the year of Isra Miraj. is the next year. So his wife, Fatima, Abu Talib's wife, is a Muslim. Her daughter becomes a Muslim. Um, Umhani and her son uh, becomes a Muslim, Ja'far radiallahu anhu, and we all know that Sayyidina Ali was a Muslim in the first a few days of Islam. So he goes there and he has uh, for dinner and they have a Isha prayer, they pray in Jama'ah, and then Umhani says, why don't you spend the night here, sleep in our house? And he says, okay. So they make a match with bed for him and he sleeps. After a brief hour of sleep, he wakes up and he goes to the Kaaba and Unfortunately, they have remodeled the cab, the, the, the buildings around the Kaaba, but the Ottoman, they left the mark where her house was. And you could see actually, up to like five, six years ago, go to the place where her house was. You can see how much the distance between her house and the, and the Kaaba was. So the Prophet goes to the Kaaba to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because night worship is very unique. And many people are deprived from night worship because wasallu bilayli wa nasu niyam. The Prophet ﷺ said one of the keys to paradise is when you pray in the night when everyone is asleep. Because that is the prayer. There's no riya in it. There's no show off. There's nothing in it except you and Allah. These are the prayer that builds connection. If you're ever lost, confused, get up at night and pray, you will find yourself. Because Allah is there waiting for you to come to Him at night when the, everybody's asleep. Right? It's kind of like going to, 
It's not kind of going to the DMV in a rush hour time. And there's lines and you have to wait for six, seven hours to even get a question answered. But imagine if DMV had a special hour. Say, hey, there's a special hour and nobody's there. But it's difficult because it's 11 o'clock at night. Nobody goes there. The night is o it's open door. But nobody goes there to knock on the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet goes and he worships Allah in, in the Kaaba. And he worships him. And then he said, a sleep came over me. And this is very interesting. Because many stories in our tradition is that they said, I wasn't sleepy, but a sleep came over me. So what does he do? He obeys this. He knows this is heavenly. So he puts his head and he falls asleep. He falls asleep and then somebody wakes him up from the sleep. He got up. He said, I look all around and I didn't see anybody. So I went back to sleep. I got woken up again. I look all around. I didn't see anybody. The third time I woke up, this is very interesting. And he goes, it was Jibreel alayhi salam. And he said, what he did, he extended his hand and I grabbed it and he pulled me. And I just realized, see the Afghanis, we always do that. I'm like, where that sunnah come from? That's from Jibreel and the Prophet sallallahu A lot of people in India, Pakistan, the Muslim community, you will see if, you set, if you're sitting on the ground, you stand up and one person is sitting, you, you grab his hand and you pull them. That's how Jibreel alayhi salam took the Prophet sallallahu by the hand on this night of Isra Miraj. And then he stood up. And then he said, you, I have an invitation for you. And then he said, invitation from who? He said, from Rabbul Alameen. Wallahi, I shiver. Can you imagine getting an invitation from Allah? We get, we get a wedding card. We get so excited, right? Invited to a banquet. We get so excited. This is a banquet. He's going to see Allah. And he says, where? He says, a place beyond places, time beyond times. We're going to cross all those barriers. And then he comes out. And he comes out. And this is very important for people to know the adab of our religion. That this deen is founded on adab. There's an animal which is outside the gate of the Kaaba. Jibreel didn't bring the animal inside. Because of the sanctuary. This is a heavenly animal. Complete, pure. This is not from the mazra of dunya. This is not from some garden that you go, oh, there's, there's some stable, you go grab an animal. This is taken from a, from a place in paradise. This is an, a, a, a heavenly beast that was brought down to the earth to give right to the Prophet wasallam. Yet still out of the adab of the haram, didn't bring it inside the sanctuary of the Kaaba. They go outside the gate and the Prophet said, what is this? He said, this is a vehicle that Allah has chosen for you to take you on this journey. Subhanallahi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Glory be to the one who has taken his servant on this night journey from Mecca, from the Kaaba to Baytul Maqdis to Jerusalem. This is the Quranic verse. Isra is in the Quran. You can't reject it. You reject it. You reject the religion. Mi'raj is in the Hadith. So he says, he the Prophet ﷺ, this is for me, I, I got, once I got stopped at the, at the border in, at the airport and I was interrogated for about four hours. This is back in the days right after 9-11 when the Muslims were being interrogated for no reason. I just came from getting married overseas. So I'm like, that's, that's the welcome congratulations you get. But anyways, one of the things that they did, the, the agents, they were asking me a lot of detailed questions. Where were you? What was your house? What's the address of the place? How many bedrooms in this house? Which bedroom did you sleep? How many beds in that room? Like really to a point where you get annoyed. But I didn't know why they were asking. And then three, four hours later, they came and said, like, what was the address of that house that you stayed? How many beds were in that room that you were sleeping? Because they know that the nature of liars is that they don't remember details. That's why liars, they never give you details. They just make it universal. Because they won't remember. You ask them in the next day, they won't remember. So this is one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ did in this journey. It's the most detailed story in all of Sirah. There's nothing more detailed than this story. And if it was a lie, if it was a made up, he would have just told us, hey, I went to Isra Miraj, I went to Jerusalem, and I went to see my Lord. Why so much detail? Because it was 
Ainul Yaqeen. It was eyewitness. Everything was eyewitness by him. So he goes and he said, this is the Buraq. It's going to give you a right. And the Prophet Sallallahu if you have Urdu books on the Sira or Farsi books on the Sira or Arabic books on the Sira or English, read it. They all say something really weird. They say, the Buraq raised his hand and didn't let the Prophet get on it. And then the Prophet went back. And then he went forward to get on it. Then the Buraq raised his hand and didn't let the Prophet get on it. And I'm like, why would he do that? Why would the Barak, that's bad adab to the Prophet ﷺ. Why wouldn't he let him write it? Now, in the famous book for the Hanafis, Salatul Adam by Hakim Samarqandi, he answers this question. He says, Jibreel alayhi salam had a whip and he disciplined the Barak. And he said to him, don't you know who this man is? And he says, this man? He's Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. He's Habibullah. He is the best of Allah's creation. And the Burak keeps going, praising the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, so if you know, because the Prophet ﷺ said in a beautiful hadith, he said, there's nothing in the creation that doesn't know I'm the messenger of Allah, except the disbelieving jinn and the disbelieving man. Everything in the creation of Allah knows I'm the messenger. This is why when he got the revelation and Allah unveiled for him as he was coming from Cave Hira to, to the house, the trees were saying, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. The rocks were saying, he could hear the trees and the rocks speaking to him because everyone knows him, right? Everyone knows him. So then he goes uh, to the book. He says, so why wouldn't you let him ride you? And this is very interesting because this is a story of love. Everyone who knows about the Prophet ﷺ will fall in love with him. Sheikh Muhammad al-Yaqubi in this masjid, he had a talk and he said, to know him is to love him and to love him is to know him. The more you know about the Prophet ﷺ, the more you will love him. The more you will love him, the more you want to know about him. This is the nature of the Prophet ﷺ. So he knew, the Barak knew who the Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, what if he rides me today? What if he rides me today? And on the day of judgment, he doesn't ride me. I will die from the pain of separation of Muhammad. I will die from the pain of separation of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is ishq, this is love. So the Prophet told Jibreel, what are you talking about? And he explained. And they said the Prophet ﷺ went, put his hand on the Burak. They said the color of Burak changed. Literally blushing. And he said, I promise you I will ride you on the day of judgment. And they said he started to sweat. Like teenagers. Love is an interesting thing. So he wrote the Barak and the Jibreel was right beside him. Now one of the things a lot of people think this Barak was flapping and struggling to get from, from Jerusalem, from Mecca to Jerusalem. Now, Sa'di Ramatullah Ali says, Savari Jahangiri Yakran Barak ke big zash as Qasra Nili Rawak. He said he wrote the Barak who had in one hop went to Jerusalem. It was just he put his feet in the front and whoosh, like an airplane. It went from Mecca to Jerusalem. When he went to Jerusalem, all of the prophets were brought and he led them in prayers. And he saw every prophet the way they appeared in the dunya in their time. That's how he saw them. As the way Musa a.s. was amongst the Bani Israel. The way Jesus was amongst his people. The way all of the prophets were amongst their people in, uh, in the appearance of the dunya. But when he sees them on the heavens, he sees them in their celestial reality. So do two different appearances. Then he leads them in the prayer. And this is where he get the title of the Imam al-Rusul. We have a beautiful poem in Arabic. Ya Imam al-Rusul, ya sanadi, anta babullahi mu'tamadi. This is beautiful that people chant this poem all the time. You are the messenger. You are the, the, the imam of all of the prophets. O messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he gets, then from here, he gets on the, goes, this is a horizontal journey, and then becomes the vertical. And then the portal opens, and he goes through the earthly, this dunya. And remember that this is not unique to our Prophet. Not unique to our Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Adam alayhi salam went, and Adam alayhi salam, uh, Hakim Samarqandi says that he went on a bed that was made out of gold, and 40 angels carried him. 
right? Jesus Ali Salam went on the feather of the angels. Every prophet, Elias, Elijah, Elias Ali Salam, he went on a chariot. This is I, I just figured this out today. Like, what does it mean? Elias Ali Salam went on a chariot of fire. I was like, chariot of fire. What does that even mean? And I realized, you know, when you have the, the space shuttle, it, they have to have fire out in order for the speed to go up. So this was a chariot that released fire for the speed. So all of the prophets, they went to this night journey, but everybody went to the degree of their station. And this is where the prophet sees all of them in their degrees in their ranks. So he goes to the first heaven, and before entering the first heaven, there's Babul Hafza, there's this security gate, and there's a security guard, Ismail. And he says, is, has this man introduced him as he received revelation? He says, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he gives him greeting of peace, and he says, welcome. Ismail has 12,000 angels under him. Each angel has 12,000 angels under him. So that's 144 million angels under one security guard of one gate of heaven. It shows us the vastness of Allah's creation. Then he goes to the first heaven. When he goes, he sees Adam alayhi salam in the first heaven. And he says, Adam alayhi salam was looking to his left and shedding tears and looking to his right and smiling. He said, what is he doing? He said, this is your grandfather, Adam alayhi salam. When he sees souls of the disbelievers, they're going to, they lie, they died in kufr. He said, he looks to the, the left and he cries for them. Because they're all his children. All of human beings are the children of Adam alayhi salam. And when he sees the believers, he smiles and he's happy that they pass through his right. And then he goes from the first heaven to the second heaven. Between each heaven, they say there's 500,000 years, the distance. And the Prophet ﷺ said the first heaven in comparison to the second heaven is like a ring thrown in a vast desert. So imagine a ring, you throw this in a Mojave desert. That's the size of the first heaven in comparison to the second heaven. And the second to the third is like a ring thrown in a vast desert. So all of these, just the size of Allah's creation, just the, just the physical size of Allah's creation, he goes and then he sees all of these prophets. But what I think about this journey, as I said at the beginning, is the detailed description. He said, Isa alayhi salam, he had freckles in his face. And it's as though he just came out of shower. His hair, you know, like when you have the, 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 the what they call the lazy wet hair. And he said, Musa alayhi salam, uh, you know, was medium height. And he had, he had a uh, wheatish color, you know, like wheatish color, not white and not dark. And then he sees Harun Ali Salam. He said he had a really big beard. And he said he had all his hair was gray. He described the hair of, of Musa Ali Salam as wavy hair. And then he says he saw, so he describes all of these prophets really in detail and, and all the visit. Then he goes to, when he sees Musa Ali Salam in the sixth heaven, and then he goes to the seventh heaven to Baytul Ma'mur. Baytul Ma'mur is a house of worship for the angels. Just like the Kaaba is a house of worship for the us, Baytul Ma'mur is for the angels. They say 70 angels go inside this bait and they do the tawaf inside. We do outside of the Kaaba, they do inside Baytul Ma'mur. It's made out of ruby according to Abdullah Ansari, the great commentator of the Quran. And he said, they don't get a second chance until the day of judgment. So you can imagine how many angels there are. So he see the Prophet said, I saw a man by Baytul Ma'mur sitting. I thought I was looking to a mirror. He looked like me. I said, who is that man? I said, that's Ibrahim alayhi salam, your great, great grandfather. And then from there, he goes to the Lot tree, the furthest point that any created being has ever gone. This is it. Beyond the Lot tree, nobody has crossed. Now, if you look at the seerah of our Prophet salam, the first time, when revelation became in Ghar Hira, people who have climbed uh, mountain of uh, light, the Ghar Hira, in that area, if you climb up, you see all of Mecca. Like the entire, it's, it's just as a beautiful, magnificent scene. So when the revelation came, uh, Jibreel opened his wings. And the Prophet ﷺ said that I looked, and everywhere I was looking, I would see his wings. He covered all of the horizon from the east to the west of the dunya. 
But according to the scholars, they say that wasn't his wings. He just opened a few feathers. The reality of Jibreel was not revealed. So the Prophet ﷺ said on this night when he got to the seventh heaven to the low tree. So you can imagine the first heaven to the second heaven is like a ring. The Prophet ﷺ said the first heaven to the seventh heaven, all of them in comparison to the Arsh of Allah is like a ring thrown in the vast desert. And right now they're at the edge of, of, of this the creation. Nothing has gone past this. Then uh, the Prophet said, Oh Jibreel, I want to see your reality. Show me. This is very beautifully those who read Urdu, they should read Bali Jibreel by Iqbal. He, he, he has a, be a beautiful, uh, really his Iqbal, Rahmatullah Ali, has a, had an amazing mind and imagination and, and just such a beautiful way of expressing these. He says, I want to see your reality. And Jibreel opens all his wings. They said there's 600 feathers on his wings and he opened it. And it covered all of the horizons of the seventh heaven, low tree. And they said the prophet fainted. He passed out. Maulana Rumi said that don't think that he passed out because Jibreel was so magnificent. No. He passed out this is one angel of Allah's creation. <laughs> this is just one angel amongst the untold number that I've seen. In the heavens, they say there's not if the size of your feet, that much space without the angel making tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's he was, he passed out just understanding the qutra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the power of Allah. That's what he passed out for. In, in uh, Mawlana Rumi, he says, he answers Jibreel in here. He answers him. Because he said, don't think that he passed out because of your wings. Don't think that. He said, Ahmad al-Bukshayad on Parri Jalil to abad madhush garda Jibreel. He said, if my Ahmad opens his spiritual wings, Jibreel would be unconscious for eternity. That's the, we call Muhammad and reality. Muhammad, that's the reality of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Prophet moves forward. He goes forward from Sidratul Muntaha. Then he turns back, see Jibreel is standing up. Go of Jibreel, or Bipar under Paya. He said, come Jibreel, come. Follow me. Go for Rau Rau. He said, no, 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 you go. You are in the league of your own. I, I can't do this. Then he said, the prophet tells him, he said, weren't you the one who was just showing your magnificent wings right now? Why don't you come? Come with me. Go birun zin haday khushfarre man garzanam parre besuzat parre man. He said, oh, my illustrious friend, Muhammad, please understand me. If I take one more step forward from this point that I'm standing, all my wings and feathers will burn and be annihilated. This is your maqam. This is your station. It's not me. You and your Lord. I can't even move anymore. So he says, the Prophet ﷺ goes forward. He goes to a point where it says, there was both lengths between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what happened in that night? Uh, you know, Allah says, I, I gave him, revealed to him, Abdi, my servant, that which I give him. This is what, Allah, what happened in that night is what happened in that night. And Allah gave him the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. These are the two, only two ayahs that was revealed Without Jibreel, they didn't bring him to the earth, but Allah gave him in the heavens. And this is why all of the words that you read, all of the books that has the awrad, they have those two verses to read daily because of the barakah in, in, in that, that is in uh, those two verses. And then the Prophet ﷺ, Allah knows all the problems. So if you look at the, the and this is a, one of the lessons that we, we have to learn from this is if you look at the Prophet ﷺ in that, in that time, 
they had so many issues. Political issues, poverty, weakness, no support. Uh, you know, it's just like people are just throwing trash on them. They're driving them out. They went to Abyssinia. And then all these problems are happening. It's too many problems. Too many problems. So he says, when he leaves, man, this is why it's so good to be from the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he leaves, he tells Allah, and Fakhruddin al-Razi in, in his, in his uh, Tafsir Kabir has it beautifully uh, described this, this conversation between him and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala where he says, everyone who goes back home from a journey, they take gifts for their beloveds. And then he said, what am I going to take from this journey to my Ummah? Now you have to think about it. We didn't exist at that time. He could have said, what am I going to take to my family? Ahlul Bayt. What am I going to take from my Sahaba? Right? Those were the people. They were all Sahaba. But the Prophet's generosity shows right here. He's thinking about us. He's thinking about our children. Until the end of time. He said, what am I going to take from my Ummah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the gift of salah, the prayer. And this is why prayer, if it's done right, you have economic problem, pray. Trust me. You have physical problem, pray. You have mental problem, pray. You have spiritual problem, pray. You have financial problem, pray. Because prayer was prescribed to take care of all of the problem. Allah could have given him, you know what, go ahead. I send some strength for you. Give energy to the sahaba that they can just take the Quraysh out. But that's not just a solution. That's, that solves one problem. It doesn't solve all of the problems. So the salah is a gift that solves every issue. It solves every issue. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he uh, he gets this gift of 50 prayers a day. Then he comes back down and Musa alayhi salam in the sixth heaven asks him, he said, what did you get? He said, Allah gave me 60, uh, 50 prayers a day. He said, your people will not do it, they're weak. Because his people did not do what he asked them to do. So he's given him really sound advice. Because prophets are brothers of each other. They're all brothers. He's given him sound advice. He can go ask for takfif. It's like going asking for discount or something, right? And it's embarrassing to ask for less, you know. It's, it's one of the most embarrassing things. So he goes and he says, Ya Allah, if you can make it less for my ummah, their du'afa, their people. And I says, okay, we'll make it 40. He comes back and says, no, no, 40, they can't do it. Goes back 30, goes back 20, goes back 10. So he goes back, the Prophet ﷺ goes back and says, and Allah says, okay, make it five. And he goes back and Musa says, I'm telling you, five is too much. And you know, he was right. <laughs> A lot of people, five prayers too much for them now, unfortunately. Uh, and the Prophet said, I feel embarrassed of going back and asking my, my you know, I'm just, I feel embarrassed going back. But this back and forth had many, you know, had many reasons. Uh, one of the commentators said, he said that Allah wanted to give five prayers from the beginning, but he gave 50 because he wanted his beloved to keep coming to him, coming back to him. It's ish, it's love. He's Habibullah, he's the beloved of Allah. So the one of the one of the, po the poets said that he he called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, brought him to Arsh. What was the reason to bring him to the Arsh of Allah on this night of Miraj? He said, Talab to deed to Miraj ta Bahanata. He said it was just wanted to see his beloved. The mirage was just an excuse. So, but the Prophet ﷺ comes back to the earth. And this is where we come in, into this story. He comes back to the earth and then they pray Fajr at Umahani's house. And he says to Umahani that I went, I prayed with you, Aisha, but you know, I went to this journey, explains the whole thing. And then I came back and I'm praying with you, Fajr. And Umahani said that. I grabbed his, his cloak and I said, please, whatever you do, don't tell the people about this. Because she knew that this is going to create, she said, by Allah, I can't speak anything but the truth. So he goes and he tells the people and people were just like, 
whoa, what did you do? You went to Jerusalem? And it takes a month at that time to go to Jerusalem and a month to come back. So the two months journey, you went on a night and came back. So Abu Jahl, and this is the split of the people in this night, it becomes really clear. Abu Jahl uh, listened, goes to the prophet, goes, so what's the news today? And he tells him about the Isra and Miraj. And he said, okay, you just hold on right here. And he's so excited because he said, you know what? I think I got him this time. And Abu Jahl's name is Abu Hakam, the father of intellect. Because he became Jahl, because he was so stubborn with the Prophet ﷺ. But he was very intelligent. He was very sharp. He was the wisest man of the Quraysh at one point. So he says, let me go and talk to Abu Bakr. If Abu Bakr leaves his religion, everybody will leave. See, that's smart. I'm going to go to the head. If Abu Bakr leaves, everybody else will follow him. So he goes to the door of Abu Bakr and knocks like madmen. And Abu Bakr uh, an, opens the door and he says, you know what your friend is saying? He's saying he went to the Jerusalem and he went to the seven. I told the whole story and he came back. You know this journey takes two months to go and come back, don't you? He says, yes. You're lying. You're lying. What are you talking about? He said, no, but I swear to you, this is what he said. This is what he said. Muhammad has said that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In kana qalat, he said, if he said it, sadaq. It's true. If he said it, then it's true. And I believe him. When he came, he sat in front of the Prophet and said, tell me what happened. And the Prophet said, last night I was at the Hatim and Jibreel came. And Abu Bakr said, yes, he did. He took me on this beast, beautiful, burak, pearl wide, with two wings above the shoulder. He said, yes, yes, he did. He said, I wrote the burak, went to Jerusalem. He said, yes, you did. And then he said, I led the, 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 the prophets in prayer. He said, yes, you did. And he said, I went to the seventh heaven, and I saw all these prophets. He said, yes, you did. And then I passed the low tree. He said, yes, you did. And the prophet looked at me, yeah, Abu Bakr, you're speaking as you were with me. That is faith. That is Iman. You want to know what Iman is? That is Iman. If you believe in it, you believe it with haqqul yaqeen. Everything for you is haqqul yaqeen. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Alif lamim dhalika al kitab la rayba fi hudan lil mutaqid. There's no doubt in this book. There's no doubt in this religion. And he said, I did. And he said, you're speaking as though you were with me. And he didn't have to be with him to be with him. He believed him. And this is when he got his title of Siddiq, the confirmer of, the great confirmer of truth. Abu Bakr Siddiq. And Siddiq is the highest maqam in Islam after the prophets. Because we can't be prophets. It's done. There's no more prophets after our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Quran talks about four categories. Min al wa siddiqeen wa shuhadai wa salihin. Amongst the four groups of paradise, either the prophets, the Siddiq, the martyrs, or the righteous. You have to become one of those in order to enter paradise. And the, and the, and the Siddiqs are the highest after the prophets. So he's Abu Bakr Siddiq. And this is why his Iman outweighs the Iman of the entire Ummah. Radiallahu an. Right? But what did he have? Faithfulness to the Prophet sallallahu You want success? Faithfulness to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi you have all the ummah. Look at the situation that we are in. It's all because of our unfaithfulness. And Iqbal Rahmatullah said that, Why are you doing this? Ya Allah, he complained in his shikwa. In his shikwa, he complained to Allah. He said, We are doing, we are praying, we're fasting, we're in a masjid, we're calling the adhan, we're giving our charity, we're doing all these stuff. But why are we in the state that we are in? There's no, look at that, look at the state of the Muslims. What's the secret? What are we missing in this ingredient? We're doing everything you ask us to do. And then when he gives the jawab, he ends it with saying, Ki Muhammad se wafa tuni to ham tere hai, ye jaha cheez hai ki Allah hu karam tere hai. If he said, be faithful, have wafa with Muhammad, be faithful to the Prophet. What do you want? You want power? You want dignity? You want honor? He said, don't worry. I can give you the law and the qalam. You write your own destiny how you want it. But be faithful to my beloved. Be faithful to my prophet. 
Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to make us human being, to make us insan al-kamil, perfect human being. Then when we walk, people say, I want to be like her. I want to be like him. I don't care what, there are people who became Muslim, they didn't know that God was a Muslim. I know people who became Muslim, and they didn't know when the guy was a Muslim. They say, I, I, what religion are you, sir? I want to become like you. Because I've been working with you for six months, and I've never seen character like this. I don't care. You're a Buddhist, I become a Buddhist. You're a Hindu, I become a Hindu. You're a Christian, I become a Christian. He said, no, I'm a Muslim. He said, I become a Muslim. That's, that's the person who's following the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Lip service is easy. Everybody can memorize a hadith and all this stuff and talk and say, but who's practicing the deen? And the practice is what's attractive to people. That's what's attractive. But if we walk on the, on the prophetic path, it's a difficult path. It's a, because it's a path of destroying your own nafs, going against your own nafs, your desires, right? And submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and putting our Prophet sallam as the model. And I always tell people, it starts with our own home. It starts with our own home. There's a beautiful poem that Ahmed Saqar, rahimahullah, from LA, he wrote a poem. When, when I first started practicing, I don't know, centuries ago, uh, I, that was a poem that really affected me. And it was called, What If the Prophet Visited Your House? What if the Prophet Visited Your House? And he said, what would you do? Would you hide magazines and all this stuff so he doesn't see it? So really, what would we do if the Prophet walked into our house? Is it a Prophet-friendly house? Right? What about our hearts? Allah is looking into our hearts. So if we change that, the change becomes from within and then walk on the prophetic path and take these examples of who he was, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and, and practice it, it will change your life, but you will see that other people will see you and they want to be like you. Everybody wants to be like you. If we become like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And everyone will love you because you are like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because his character is lovable. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah ibarak fikum jazakallah khair. I don't even know what time it is. Um, sorry if I went too long. May Allah bless all of you. And may Allah uh, protect all of you from all of the earthly and airborne diseases, inshallah. And may the, this be the end of this pandemic, inshallah. And may Allah protect our children from all of the evil and facade of their time and makes them amongst the salihin wa salihat. It makes them amongst the people that Allah is pleased with them and the Prophet Sallallahu is proud of them on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And may Allah protect this community from all of the evil of our time. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Rahmeen. And may Allah keep us on the path of fitra, Ya Allah, in the time of confusion. Ya Rahman Rahmeen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmeen. Bi rahmatika, Ya Rahman Rahmeen.